Hey, how you doing, YouTube? This is your boy, Brogy Narg, back again with the, another review for Vice TV's Dark Side of the Ring. Going to be reviewing the recent episode, In the Shadow of Grizzly Smith. A very dark and serious episode. An episode I was looking forward to because the story was just uh, very interesting. And definitely learned a lot of new things that I didn't know about this with this story. But uh, before I get into this review, don't forget to give this video a like, share it, and uh, subscribe to the channel. We're still growing, and we could use your help, so thanks for doing so. Now, if you've seen the previous videos, we'll be doing this one solo. My boy Cuba couldn't make it, but, you know, it is what it is. But, um, so, yeah, that's what it is. We're going to be talking about the uh, In the Shadow of Grizzly Smith, which focuses on the Smith family, which is uh, one of the not mo not well known wrestling uh i guess dynasties in a way as uh jim Cornette talks about in this uh episode about the different wrestling families like you have the von Erichs, you have the hart foundation the anawahi family which is you know the rock and all the other samoans you know that are tied into that you know the roman reigns and the yokozunas and the uh uh, uh chief peter maivias the night jacks is all of them you got the Mysterio family, you got the Guerreros, uh, oh, the Ortons, uh, the, the Ortons, the uh, the Hennings, you know, stuff like that. But the Smiths are more of a not as well known because their the relationships between the siblings was kind of kept secret until, you know, at least kept secret to the fans because the people in the business knew. But you have uh, Grizzly Smith, who was the, the patriarch, and then you have his oldest son, uh, Aurelian Smith, Jake the Snake Roberts. You got uh, Michael Smith, I believe was Michael. Uh, Sam Houston, then you have Robin Smith, who is uh, Rockin' Robin. Of course, the other sons. There were other kids outside of that as well. I'll get more into them. But uh, the Smith family has a lot of uh, known names and also a lot of dark tragedy. And this is what this episode really focused on was that's all the different crazy shit that happened with uh, the, the children that were raised under Grizzly Smith. Uh, Grizzly Smith was a wrestler back in the uh, 50s and 60s and I guess in the 70s as well. Uh, known as our, our real name Aurelian Smith, born in uh, August 1st, 1932 and passed in uh, June 12, 2010. Uh, he was a wrestler known for his giant size. He was, uh, as they say, he was an oil field worker. And he eventually got into the business because of his look. You know, he was about seven feet tall, 350 pounds, red hair, looked like this big, huge hillbilly redneck. That's basically his gimmick. And he would just beat the shit out of people in his matches. And uh, I'm not too familiar with his work. I don't think I've ever seen any of his matches. He, uh, you know, he was in a tag team with Luke Brown called the Kentuckians. And he also, once he retired, he worked as like a road agent and a uh, backstage producer for various companies like uh, UWF, uh, Wrestling F World Wrestling Federation and uh, World Championship Wrestling. And um, he was also uh, allegedly, because I have to say allegedly, because the man was never convicted of any actual wrongdoings. I will say that up front, but here's a story from his children and just some of the oddness about the man uh, he was an abusive and manipulative father and allegedly a uh, sex offender uh, and, a, and a, a pedophile, as what uh, Jake Snakes is outright says. And um, a lot of dark, fucked up shit in this episode. So, um, as I said, it starts off with Cornette running down the various uh, wrestling families. Um, we focus on Jake the Snake Roberts, a.k.a. Irelian Smith. Uh, oldest son of Grizzly Smith, uh, one of the greatest heels and promos in the wrestling business. One of my favorite wrestlers, definitely my probably my favorite heel in the business. Um, creator of DDT, and uh, he got into the business trying to live into it, live in his father's shadow, which his dad, uh, from what Jake says, wasn't um, didn't want him to wrestle and didn't make it easy for him when he got into the business. Um, now, Jake, you know, he had a unique look because he was tall, but he was kind of thin. He wasn't a body guy. He wasn't super ripped. He didn't have the best physical body, didn't have the best physical skills in the ring. But he did understand the psychology of wrestling, and he knew how to make people hate him, or at least make a, a certain realism to his work. He knew how to be vicious. He knew how to make people hate him. 
And that was the thing that made him so awesome and eventually started to get over as a baby face because people were getting tired of Hogan and his bullshit and, you know, Jake was something different. Jake was dope. He had some great storylines, both as a heel and as a face. And But he also had some fucked up uh, stories outside of wrestling with his, you know, drug addiction, which this episode doesn't go into. It doesn't go deep, deep into it because if you haven't seen the, um, the resurrection of uh, Jake the Snake from uh, DDP, his documentary from a couple of years ago, that really goes deep into more of the, the darker sides of what Jake went through. This episode definitely focuses, like I said, on more of the family. And um, Jake retells the story, which I, I remember him mentioning it in uh, Beyond the Mats, where he talks about how uh, his dad was dating this woman, and eventually he did... Uh, his dad, Grizzly Smith, started... He had sex with this woman's daughter, who was 13, and that woman's daughter is Jake's mom. So... Yeah, and that's what he mentions that his dad it was a pedophile because he had a child with a 13-year-old girl. Now, granted, I'm not sure what state that was in. I don't know if that was in Texas or Kentucky or wherever the fuck it was. But in America, especially back in, I think that might have been the 60s or maybe the 50s. I think it was the 60s. There are certain there's certain laws where the, the age of consent is, is not 18. Like, it genuinely is. Certain states have it where it's like, 15 or 14, you get married if you have parental consent. It's, it's fucked up, but that's what happened with that. And um, Jake was born. He was, you know, a fan of his father. All the kids grew up loving their father as a wrestler. And I thought it was interesting how they mentioned how their dad would kayfabe them, where he would um, min he would actually, like, tell the kids, like, yeah, those people have really beaten the shit out of me. I'm really hurt. And these people hate me and they might, you know, come after me. And they, the kids, especially Jake and uh, Robin mentions how, like, I did kind of fuck with them growing up thinking that their dad was always under attack and people were trying to hurt them, which is kind of interesting thing when you hear about that, especially when you hear about other wrestlers uh, who whose parents were wrestlers and they talk about how they, you know, thought their, 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 their family was, you know, in danger. But you don't really hear about it affecting them that much for or at least they kind of get over it but i thought it was kind of interesting how this really did fuck with uh jake and, and robin and some of the others and um jake you know he kept wrestling even though his dad didn't want him to he was you know helping him get fired a couple of jobs and getting beat up but he, he kept pushing because he really wanted his his father's admiration but he also uh as his other brother uh i think it was robert it was his other brother uh uh, his other brother Richard had mentioned like Jake also just liked the fame he liked the, the thrill of wrestling and um yeah and nothing wrong with that but we also get into some of the other kids we got uh Michael Michael Smith aka uh Sam Houston who was a wrestler as well uh he had a cowboy gimmick I'm not familiar with uh Sam Houston he worked in the NWA the UWF and the WWF um, he's considered to be the best worker out of the family, being he he was the best in ring. He could do a lot of movement and stuff like that. As uh, Cornette, uh, Cor Jim Cornette mentions, though, he was undersized, and that was kind of one of his downfalls in terms of in the wrestling business. You know, back in the '80s when everything was about the big, you know, big muscular guys, he was he was much smaller, and that kind of worked against him. And uh, Michael, he you know he seemed to be the closest with his dad out of the uh out of the family he was the one that definitely idolized him the most it seems and um he also had his demons mainly being alcoholism uh that moment when he mentioned that he had like the texas dui record for like the most duis was like wow like that's in that's that's insane just to hear that like you have the most dui records in the state especially a big ass state like texas that's pretty crazy and also about how like his dad had enough pull to get him off and that kind of saved him a little bit. You know, he would get off light, light, light offense charges and stuff like that until eventually he was, you know, sent to jail. And, um, you know, he he was in jail for like two days and almost tried to kill himself, you know. But he, he ended up serving, I think, uh, I don't remember how long he served. Damn, I didn't write that. I think he served about 10 years, maybe seven or so years. I'm, I might be off on that one. But he did serve some time and that seemed to help him get a little better with his uh, life decision. Uh, we also have Richard uh, Richard Neighbors, who is the son. I think he was the second oldest of the, of the kids. 
He's another son of Grizzly Smith. He's the one who who didn't get into wrestling, uh, lived a uh, you know a normal life. He didn't want to be in the wrestling business. He didn't want to have to do all that traveling. Um, he was the one who was once the initial family broke up when Jake's uh, mom and Grizzly Smith broke up, and the kids were at that point. I think it was just Jake and um, I think it was just Jake, Sam, and uh, and uh, Richard. They were split up and raised by different family members, and uh, he was given up for adoption. And he he considers himself to be the lucky one because he was never uh, back under the the caretaking of Grizzly Smith at the time. Because um, I think Sam Sam and Jake ended up back under his care because the grandparents that was taking care of Jake had passed, and I think Michael was under someone else. So they ended up under Grizzly Smith's uh, care again. And at that time, Grizzly Smith had a new wife, another young woman who was about, uh, I think, 16 to 17, named uh, yeah, named Marsha, who is the mother of Rock and, of Robin Smith, a.k.a. Rock and Robin. And I, I think Rock and Robin is the MVP of this episode. Um, she's a former wrestler, former uh, WWF uh, ladies champion. She's a, a pioneer in women's wrestling. And um, she, you know, she had not a super long career because the women's division didn't last that long in the WWF. It was gone for a while and they brought it back in like, I think the early 90s. And then they brought it, it kind of went away a little bit, then it came back again. It's kind of kind of weird history with the women's division in the WWF. But um, she talks about how she uh, was uh, basically molested and, and, you know, psychologically manipulated by her father from around the ages of like six to 14. And, um, and this is interesting moment where Jake talks about how the new stepmom who would be Rock and Robin's mom also, uh, sexually assaulted him and, and, and molested him, which I thought it was interesting when the producers asked Rock and Robin about those accusations. Robin didn't fully go, I believe it. She was kind of like, I don't think my mom would have did that. But she does say if it did happen, she kind of believes maybe Grizzly would have pushed her towards that, which I thought was an interesting, you know, viewpoint of like how the, the, the kids kind of view their, their parents and maybe not knowing all about them, whether, you know, she, the mother did that or not. It's kind of, kind of, it's a, it's a fucked up situation either way you, you look at it to have, you know, those type of accusations. And, um, you know, she eventually she told her mother about the abuse and they got away. Her mother was like, um, her mother was like 17 or so around the time when they, when they first, when, uh, her, when her, her, Robin's mother and Grizzly Smith got together. Um, once again, like I said, certain, the age consent is different in different states, but it's a little weird. It's a lot weird. It's a lot weird. Um, she talks about how, like, when she was 15, she... She, when she got away from him, she threatened to shoot him with one of her, one of his guns if he ever touched her again. Um, wild, just just wild shit. And the story gets uh, even crazier when you find out about the sister Jolyn, I think Aurelian, I mean jo, Jolyn Smith, who was the oldest daughter of the family, and she was I think a different mother from Jake and um, and and I, I think maybe her and uh, the other brother. Uh, Richard had the same mother. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not sure about that. But she was the other sister. She was like the older sister of the family. She talks about when she was around 15. Her sister Jolyn came to visit her, and they hung out for a day. And she was checking up on her, trying to feeling her out, trying to see if she, you know, trying to talk her through some of the trauma she may have gone through, but not outrightly saying it. But that's what Robin suspected. That's what was gonna. She was trying to low key trying to, you know check up on her and then about two weeks after that she was kidnapped or as i say kidnapped because they they don't they it was it was weird circumstances behind this and this is another crazy part of the story where their sister was uh kidnapped the brother richard was uh the closest to her and he was like super pissed uh she just had a baby before her disappearance and uh the 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 police investigates we, we are introduced to, uh, what's his name, Carl Gage, a.k.a. Buzz, who was the former police chief in Tatum, Texas, back in the uh, the, eight, the 80s when this had happened. He was 27 years old, at the, uh, 28 years old at the time. 
Um, interesting looking guy. He look he definitely looks like one of the members of the uh, the Hateful Eight. Uh, he had this like dope mustache. Not back in the day, but like currently. And he talks about how he was lead investigator on the, uh, Joe Lee Joe Lynn's uh, kidnapping, um, which was an unusual case in their small town of uh, Tatum, Texas. And uh, they interviewed the husband back at the trailer park, and they found some threatening letters in their trailer that was from her uh, Joe Lynn's husband's ex-wife, uh, Faye Lynn Rogers. They go to investigate her. They find some incriminating evidence in her car, and. Through some interrogation, the ex-wife eventually confesses that, yeah, we we, kid, we kidnapped Joe Lynn. They don't really go into who we was, but it was her and, I'm guessing, some other people. They kidnapped her, but she escaped. And uh, they never found her body after that. They, they tried, you know, doing a bunch of different searches. Uh, they even had a psychic come in to help, and or a, a psychic offered their help, and that didn't really, they never found her body. Um, when they had the court case, uh, Phelan, Phelan Rogers, you know, they didn't have the body, so they couldn't give her any strong charges. So she got off pretty, pretty, she got like, I think he said she only served, she got, she got sentenced like 33 years, but she only served about seven or so, uh, cause they didn't have any hard evidence. They couldn't find the body. They could find no trace of her. Yeah. Um, then it kind of gets a little crazy where, you know, well, they, they mentioned, it was mentioned that their father was always at tr trial. He didn't let the kids go. And he was, um, he carried a garrote, you know, like a string with some some handles on it. And he wanted to get close to that woman and strangle her as the, as the legend goes. And they had, you know, a bunch of cops surrounding him because he was a big man and they didn't want him to, you know, get loose in the, in the courtroom. And um, it, it is suspected that maybe Grizzly Smith had a hand in her disappearance. There's once again no truth to that, but that's kind of been like a another accusation or or urban legend about the disappearance of that sister. Because some may say, well, maybe she was going to expose him or try to get some charges pressed on him, and then he kind of made her disappear. Who knows? Um, another person in the story, Nicola Roberts Bird, aka Baby Doll, former wrestler and uh, manager back in the day. Uh, you know, she grew up in a wrestling business. She's Sam Houston's ex-wife. She mentioned how, you know, when Sam would get into trouble with the law and her his dad would get him off, you know, his dad was connected enough to, you know, to get him out of those situations. And she kind of was like, maybe he, he, he knew the right people to talk to, but he also, he had like a certain amount of dirt on certain people to make things happen. Who knows, you know? Um, but she also talks about how she would travel with Rizzy Smith in her the early parts of her career, you know, going from town to town, just, you know, to hang with him and, and pick his brain about the business, you know, what wrestlers did back in the day, especially with older wrestlers. They would take those long trips and get ideas and stories and all of that. But she mentions how there would be times where he would stop and pick up these random underage girls uh, at certain stops that they would be on the road with him for like a couple of days. And she's like, she, she's like, she saw it, but she witnessed it, but she never put two and two together until years later when more of these stories and accusations came out. So it's like, you know, you could be there in the thick of it and not quite realize, you know, what the fuck is going on. You know, it's some, some wild, it's some wild shit in this uh, episode. Um, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty fucked up. But Cornette even mentions why he started working. I think he was at UWF when he started working. They would. The wrestlers would be backstage telling certain jokes about Grizzlies fondness for young girls and stuff like that. It's like kind of creepy, you know, when you hear these things. It's like somewhat out in the open, but nothing necessarily confirmed, you know. It's crazy. It, it makes me think of, really, it makes me think of, um, uh, what was the dude's name? Um, he was the coach for Penn State. Was it Sandusky? It's like the, Sa the Sandusky shit and the, and the Joe Paterno stuff. Like It kind of makes me think of that, but it's like it's out in the open. It's going on for years, but no one truly says anything you know um it, it kind of makes it, it's sad that shit like that happens you know where certain people have a certain amount of power or respect and you know they let certain shit slide you know it's, it's, it's just fucked up but um we get more into like you know jake every, all the kids suffered with their trauma or dealt with their trauma in different ways sam houston with the excessive drinking robin got into excessive drinking jake got into uh, cocaine and various other drugs and alcohol, which, you know, affected his life for years. 
you know, Drake was one of the notorious wrestlers for drug issues for a long time. Like he, as uh, Cornette calls him, the Keith Richards of wrestling. Um, there were others who had problems too, but Jake was the one that had the problems and somehow still managed to survive. <laughs> not that, you know, God, God bless him, you know, for living. But, um, you know, he, he went through some wild shit through his years. Uh, they talk about his uh, drugged up craziness at the Heroes of Wrestling pay-per-view. Which you, I've seen the clips, never watched the pay-per-view, but I've seen the clips of him drunk and he's got the lady rubbing on his chest and he's got the snake waving it around like it's his dick and all that. Like, it's, it's wild. That's like one of the craziest, like, it's as it's, it's bad as uh, was, uh, Jeff Hardy when he had that match with Sting where he was high as shit. Like, it's bad. It's on that level. It's just like, that you shouldn't be in the ring, man. Like, they shouldn't let you out there. But, um, you know, Jake, you know, Jake talks about how he's been sober for 10 years, still fighting through it, um, which I said is commendable. R- Rock and Robin, you know, her career's slowed down after WWF got rid of the uh, women's division. Uh, but she, you know, she's still, like I said, a pioneer. She kept it going. Um, and they, you know, the episode ends with, them playing for those who have been affected by, you know, sexual violence to seek help and alert someone, which is, is a noble cause. Um, and like the kids, they never grew up that close and they still aren't that close. And they all would like to get together, but you know, it is what it is. I understand that it's, it's sometimes it happens with siblings, you know, especially if you didn't grow up close, you don't necessarily overly feel the need to be up under each other all the time. But, um, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's, crazy crazy story um the, the stuff with the sister that that disappeared i knew nothing about that so that was just shocking um and all the crazy accusations so once again none of this was ever confirmed the man died before he was any charges brought against him um which was was interesting he died of um alzheimer's and richard of all the kids was the one that was um who took care of him in his final years um, even though he was not around his dad the most, he was the one in the end that, that was around his father, um, which is, you know, crazy how that, that kind of happens like that. But rough, rough episode. I can't say it was a great episode because of the subject matter, but it, it definitely was, uh, in terms of dark side of the ring, it definitely was one of the more darker episodes that they've done. I, I would say it's like this and the, the Benoit one, What's another really dark one? I guess Pillman, to a degree. Um, the, uh, the, not the Guerrero one, the, uh, what's his name? Gino Hernandez and the Dino Bravo ones. You know, just wild, crazy stories in the business of just, you know, just, whew, you know, man, it's really crazy. But that's all I have to say about this episode. Let me know what you thought about it in the comments. Um, don't forget to like this video and share it. We'll, I'll definitely be back for the next episode, which will focus on uh, the Dynamite Kid, which I know is another crazy son of a bitch in the business. I've heard some various stories about it. I don't know all the stories, but I know he's got some, some fucked up stories as well. So that's going to be interesting to see that. But, um, you know, uh, thanks for watching and uh, stay tuned for more videos. Peace.